Bill Peter Yazi Distinguished Lecture in Intellectual Property. Um, this is going to be another wonderful uh, evening for us all. Um, we are going to uh, hear first uh, from the Dean of our law school, Camille Nelson, and then from the man himself, Peter Yazi, who will introduce our speaker tonight. And um, at the conclusion of the lecture, there will be a time for question and answer. And then after that, we would like you to join us for yet another reception. Uh, <laughs> that's how we do things. We have uh, sandwiched receptions. Um, so without further ado, I'm so delighted that our dean could be with us tonight. So let me welcome uh, to the podium Camille Nelson. Thank you, Professor Farley. And good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> this is a really special occasion. We get to celebrate Peter and welcome Ruth. This is wonderful. It is a pleasure to welcome you all this evening for the eighth Peter Yazi Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property. This very special gathering would not have been possible without the dedicated work of our program on information justice and intellectual property pitch up. Many thanks to Professors Christine Farley and Mike Carroll, and thank you to Sean Flynn and the whole PIDGIP team. We are most grateful. Washington College of Law is widely recognized as one of the finest schools at which to study IP. And for over 13 years, we have hosted this distinguished lecture series on intellectual property, recognizing the leading thinkers in the field. One such leader, is tonight's distinguished lecturer. Ruth Ekadiji is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Klein Center. Ruth is a renowned scholar in international intellectual property law and a foremost authority on the role of intellectual property in social and economic development. The title of her lecture today is the Unfinished Business of Copyright Limitations and Expectations. Professor Okadiji, we are honored to welcome you and thank you for being here this evening. And I want to just say, having had the opportunity to speak with Peter just before we started, he was absolutely raving about you. And you should know that because good people need to know what good people are saying about them. Eight years ago, this distinguished lecture was named in honor of Professor Emeritus Peter Yazi in recognition of his extraordinary contributions to the study of intellectual property at WCL and for his lasting contributions to the elevation of the public interest as a primary concern in this domain of law and policy. An early leader and advocate for copyright law in the public interest and a founder of the Digital Future Coalition, Professor Peter Yazi has long been at the forefront of intellectual property and copyright law with a particular focus on promoting user interests in the law. As an educator, he has encouraged our students to explore and become actively engaged in all facets of copyright law. Professor Yazi is an internationally recognized and renowned scholar whose trailblazing work on the concept and conceptualization of authorship in copyright law has informed a generation of scholars. Perhaps most centrally to us here at WCL, Professor Yazi founded the two most important and lasting property, intellectual property institutions at this great law school, the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic and the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Peter, it's great to see you. And we are proud to have you as a lasting and long-serving member of our community. Thank you for all you have done, Peter, to elevate this law school and the place of the public interest in IP law. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And Professor Yazi will now have the honor of welcoming our distinguished lecturer. Thank you all. So this has been a year of anniversaries. I'm 
some somber, some hopeful era in the in the months of 2019. We have we have acknowledged the significant of dates in history from 1619 to 1969. Now, most recently, we seem to be talking a lot about 1989 and the importance of commemorating and, and learning from those the events of that year. But there's one related anniversary that I haven't actually seen mentioned yet and that I wanted to call out tonight at the beginning of this introduction. And that is that 2019 also marks the 60th anniversary of a milestone event that took place in 1959, which was the US publication of a novel that changed our understanding of the world. Junua Kibi's Things Fall Apart. Here's what Vanity Fair editor Radhika Jones wrote of, back in 2013 in The Guardian about the career and accomplishments of this great writer. He began by saying, there's, Akibe once said, it was in a Paris Review interview some years ago, there is a great proverb that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Uh, Akibe wrote Jones, is one who always spoke for the lions. Well, the lions need lawyers as well as historians. <laughs> well, that brings me to the point of introducing our guest. I say it proudly, our friend, <clears throat> the scholar and activist, Professor Ruth KDG, Harvard Law School. It's a special, special pleasure to welcome her back to WCL for the first time since last year's Global Congress on intellectual property in the public interest, where she anchored a memorable all-star panel on intellectual property and development. Throughout her career, Ruth has been a champion of what might be called representational justice. Consistently, wisely, graciously, passionately, and most of all, effectively, she has given voice and presence to the interests of the vulnerable and the marginalized post-colonial populations striving for better lives materially and culturally, women and children everywhere, disabled people, and more. They have interests in the international intellectual property system, along with cultural producers and companies of the West and she isn't about to allow us to forget it. She is, of course, a technical expert of the highest order, but in a field that is too often portrayed as value-neutral domain of transactions and trade, she continues to remind us that fundamental human values matter. To illustrate Professor Akeji's extraordinary effect and the struggle for information justice. Let me hear slightly the, the veil of her personal modesty and point out one event from among the many on which her influence has been felt in recent years. And of course, I mean the 2013 Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works by visually impaired persons and persons with print disabilities which is now being implemented in countries of, at every level of development all around the world and is marking the beginning of an end to the book famine in which blind and print disabled people have suffered from literally the beginnings of print culture. True, this treaty was the work of many hands over many years, but we need to acknowledge that there's an extremely small central group of individuals without whom it would never have been accomplished. And Ruth is one of those. It would never have seen the light of day, so to speak, without her. For that, we 
and so many others are in her debt. Now I said activist and scholar, so let me turn to scholarship. Ruth is not simply someone who makes things happen. She's also a prodigious researcher and an elegant, persuasive storyteller. Her scholarship has extraordinary reach, and it ranges in terms of its subject matter across a full spectrum of both international and domestic IP topics. But for sure, she has some history with the topic of tonight's lecture, which is limitations and in, in, in exceptions in copyright law. I should pause, of course, and say that this is also something of a preoccupation with many of us here at Pigeon. <laughs> made so many contributions to this specific topic that I cannot even begin to name them all, but I will mention two that I think are of extraordinary importance and have pushed this discussion along in the last decade. One is the study report that she co-authored in 2008 with Bear Kogenholz, a groundbreaking document called Conceiving an International Instrument on limitations and exceptions to copyright, which has really become, for everyone who's followed throughout this struggle, an in, in, in inevitable and, and invaluable point of reference. And then more recently, in 2017, a wonderful book with Cambridge University Press, who edited and wrote a magisterial survey introduction to, and then ended up writing also a provocative final chapter of conclusions. It's called Copyright Law in an Age of Limitations and Exceptions. And if you don't know it, I urge you to do so, or to get to know it, because it will repay a reading. Tonight, she's going to look forward to address the question of what future roles, limitations, and exceptions can play in securing truly just copyright system. And before I turn the floor over, I want to go back for a moment to where I began. In a, in a late essay, Akebe <clears throat> wrote of his belief that a writer's lot was to strive, and here I quote, to create a different order of reality from that which is given to him. That's hard for writers, you may say, but it's it's an even greater challenge for lawyers. Nevertheless, it aptly describes Ruth Akavici's grand and important project. There can be no greater praise than to say that she, too, always speaks for the lions. Oh. Hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure who Peter just introduced. <laughs> and so whoever that person is can feel free to come to the podium at any time. <laughs> so then I will uh, give a few remarks this evening. Let me say thank you to my friends, Christine and Sean and, and um, Peter, who is not just a friend, but who has been a mentor uh, to me over many years. Many of you, of course, in this community know Peter, you, you know his impact in the copyright field, you, you know the um, amazing uh, effect that his work has had on many young scholars. You no doubt know um, that Peter has not only been an advocate for a copyright regime that um, makes the most of life for all people, but that he also is attentive to the interests of authors and, um, and creators. And so he is not one that one might describe as an uh, ideologue. But what you probably don't know about Peter is um, who he is as a mentor. And Peter, in his very quiet way, I was a very young scholar. My name wasn't even Okereji. Um, and uh, I had written in a fit of rage um, over a three-day period, a little essay called His Creativity Died in the Third World. And uh, I had just written this because I had stumbled across some work that I'd been thinking about, and, and it made it sound that the only place where creativity flourished was in Hollywood. And in fact, no one 
um, outside of the global north uh, was capable of producing works that were important enough to be part of our <coughs> cultural marketplace. And so I, I was just both troubled and annoyed, and, and I did what probably no young scholar should do, is that I, I literally stayed up three days and I wrote this piece. And, and I didn't, nobody told me anything about publications or uh, trying to get to the best journal. I didn't know anything. I just wrote it and I sent it out. Um, and I accepted um, the first of many offers that came. But you know, you never know as a scholar where your work will end up. You, you don't actually know, right? Who you're influencing, who you're impacting, does anybody care? Is it a bedtime story that sends people to sleep? And I was sitting um, at a conference and Peter saw my name tag and said, I'm so delighted to meet you. Um, you've written this short essay that I assigned to my class. It was wonderful. It's necessary. Um, it revealed some things that I hadn't thought about. And he just went on and on. And I remember going, is he, is he talking about me? <laughs> But that conversation um, really changed the trajectory of my career because when you're writing in a voice from a perspective and with an opinion that is not at the time dominant, is not at the time popular, um, and not many people are saying it, you're never quite sure, did I miss it entirely? Um, and will this be a basis for the um, end of a very short scholarly career. And that conversation <laughs> with Peter um, really uh, boosted my confidence. And, and Peter did it in an age, it's really popular now, perhaps more popular certainly, to have people who um, mentor uh, women and, and women of color in particular. It wasn't popular then. It wasn't the thing to do. Peter didn't have to do it. Um, and he did, he took me under his wing. He uh, chided me when I made overly ambitious statements. He questioned my optimism. <laughs> he um, pushed back on some of my arguments. <clears throat> and so to the extent that I'm a good scholar today, it's because he has poured so much into me and I'm grateful and honored to be here. I want to spend the next uh, <clears throat> half hour or so speaking to you on the topic that I have described as the unfinished business of copyright limitations and exceptions. The incentive rationale for copyright remains really the cornerstone of the design and the content of copyright law. When we talk about copyright, when we teach our students, when we go to other countries, when we justify copyright laws in international fora, we begin with this verse, that copyright is necessary to supply incentives for authors. We don't really talk about what those incentives are. Uh, we don't uh, define even who these authors are. Um, but we certainly are insistent that incentives are at the heart of what copyright law is about. So from start to fit, are somebody trying to get me water? <laughs> I can see the whispering going on there. <laughs> From start to finish, authorship, enforcement, remedies, we frame our national and even now our global discourse around this idea that incentives are necessary and that copyright incentives are what affect and influence ordinary people like you and I to create. But if incentives are truly the lifeblood of copyright's existence, if it's the sole or primary reason that we are willing to, um, as I have been saying recently, consort with copyright, adapt to it, accommodate it, then we have to ask ourselves a question, why are we so critical of its outcomes? And when that critique comes, it is often a critique not of authorship per se, um, but it's a critique about its impact for society overall. We talk about copyright law as though it is very different from the justifications around incentives that we have spent so much of our professional and uh, uh, scholarly careers as copyright professors and advocates and, and activists uh, talking about. I will not be the first, nor will I be the last, to suggest that uh, what copyright law is, 
And what copyright law does often appear in tension, if not outright irreconcilable. Our best efforts to do this reconciling has been through this mechanism of limitations and exceptions. And I want to suggest that um, this focus um, in PDIP and in, in much of what we're seeing around today um, might need to be done with some caution. And so while I have not fully myself internalized much of what I will share with you tonight and much of my arguments, I want to put a couple of things on the table that I hope will stimulate our work for the time to come. It's important to me that limitations and exceptions, which have been sort of the, the bastion of uh, copyright justice. It, it has been the instrument that we rely on, in some ways over rely on, to correct the excesses of copyright law. Um, it's important that limitations and exceptions in five or 10 years don't look like copyright itself. Where what we have advocated and designed and justified or theorized is a body of exceptions and limitations that work the same way, look the same way, operate the same way, no matter what the subject matter is and no matter what part of the globe we are in. We assume much like copyright law assumes that one size fits all. And in our discourse about limitations and exceptions, we are seeing the same uh, mistake, I believe, being repeated, where we treat limitations and exceptions, at least theoretically, as though uh, they are designed to do exactly what copyright law is not doing. But I think that this is a mistaken view of limitations and exceptions. And I think that we must keep in mind the possibility that the ends we want to accomplish with limitations and exceptions, including open-ended ones like fair use, require us to be much more critical about the communities and the kind of creativity that limitations and exceptions facilitate access to. In my view, we are no longer tinkering around, if we ever were, with the small chapel-like structure that the Statute of Anne depicted um, back in its heyday. Um, that was a chapel that accommodated very few members of the British society. It was a chapel that was designated for a particular kind of worship. And it was not designed, despite much of our historical and somewhat romanticized view of the Statute of Anne, it was not a law that was concerned with or designed to address the great inequalities in England or in British society. And to be sure, there were many of them. So one of the things that I find ironical, for example, is that the Statute of Anne talks about mandatory deposits in a library. But it was not until 1906 that women could become librarians. These books that were being deposited, uh, this mandatory deposit regime that was meant to facilitate access to knowledge, in fact, was sealed to significant populations in British society. Indeed, to, to just, I love librarians. Many of you know that my mom was a, was a librarian and, and I grew up in libraries. And it's stunning, I think, to realize just how recent, just how modern a development it is that there are so many women um, in the library community. So despite this limitation that required mandatory deposit, which we have benefited from in the United States, in fact, women had no access to that knowledge. Indeed, women weren't even allowed to graduate from Oxford until 1920, even though many of the deposits went to these significant universities in the United Kingdom. So there were lots of inequalities, lots of inequities. And copyright law, I hate, I regret to say, was not designed at all to do the kinds of things that we hope, anticipate, and advocate that limitations and exceptions must do today. Nor was the Statute of Anne a law that was crafted with consideration for the illiterate, the downcast, or those uh, that were relegated to the so-called non-productive stations of life. As significant as copyright law was in 1710, history tells us that it did not alter the conditions of what Puritan writer Richard Baxton described as the rabble that cannot read. That rabble that cannot read still exists today. Note here that Richard Baxton, when he was talking, uh, didn't even talk about writing. He just talked about reading, the consumption of knowledge. 
And it's interesting that while copyright and publishing made many works available to read, it did not liberate people to write. And of course, this design, one might say, was intentional, perhaps, perhaps not, but it is not inconsequential that the design of being able to read while not being able to write produced, of course, a partly literate society, a society in which people could read and obey instructions and perform the outward functions of participating in the economy, but in fact could not contribute or advance within that economy. It was a society in which only the intellectually productive class could accumulate and more critically spend social capital. Because in order to actually do that, you had to be able to write. Because it is in the writing that creativity occurs, at least the kind of creativity that copyright law is concerned about. That, I think, is a great injustice. So even at, at its most liberal, copyright was not designed to transform the accessibility of nor the participation in cultural production. But here's the key. It had the capacity to do so. And that capacity is found, at least partially, in these limitations and exceptions. And so in my talk tonight, I want to talk about the shape of this capacity. What is the shape of this potential? Um, and who gets to participate in it? Because I think if we ask those kinds of questions, it enables us to design and to think about our advocacy and our policy press for limitations and exceptions in a way that doesn't relegate other members of society to what women were relegated at at the time of the Statute of Anne. Julie Cohen has argued that the story that we tell ourselves obscures the reality of copyright's true economic and cultural functions. I think it's relatively clear today that copyright and the intensity of scrutiny that it faces has come to grapple with the fact that copying is basic. We all copy. We could not live without copying. It is a fundamental part of how we learn, and it is a fundamental part of creativity. But the disjunctive between the ban on copying that copyright law is, for the most part, and the need to copy is what Peter himself has noted in an important article, the observation that law itself has always lagged behind in its assimilation of new theories um, and their associated rhetorics. He notes in that article that copyright does not exist in a vacuum and in fact is shaped by those who are involved with cultural production. The judges, the creators, and sometimes even the public are all part of this copyright ecosystem that interacts with the culture in ways, as he notes, that are both good and bad. This means that copyright law is always linked to a discourse that is delinked from the actual practices of members of a cultural society in which we anticipate that everyone will be able to access books and read them and write and produce them, in which people will be able to gather around cultural goods and facilitate not only their use, but also their reuse and their recreativity. And so ultimately, we have found that this human instinct for self-preservation that has manifested so aggressively in our copyright battles in this country in particular, um, has adopted many technological and legal solutions to maintain this bar on access or to access to public goods. And the result is ironic, is that we are seeing in the US and the EU an outcry that is similar only to the kinds of concerns we heard articulated 30 years ago in developing countries, where citizens in those communities argued that these rules essentially make it impossible for people to climb into a culturally productive class. In other words, copyright for a long time in the Global South in particular, has produced dislocation rather than integration in society. It has produced disruption and dependence rather than human flourishing. And so in the early years of their independence, many developing countries signed these treaties um, thinking it would in fact bring the productivity to a greater number of people, but instead it consolidated 
the cultural hierarchy of the production of goods from the global north. And in the last 50 years, it has been hard to see any empirical data that suggests that copyright law has in fact been part of pushing for the grandest ideals um, of human and cultural flourishing. This is why some of Sean's work, some of the work PJP has been doing, um, advocating for limitations and exceptions as part of a copyright reform package in some of the leading countries around the world has become more critical and more urgent today. Now here's the downside. Copyright law somehow has started to function um, like we might see certain diseases in the health sphere. Uh, copyright law with its incentive rationale with its encouragement for a cultural production that is institutionalized um, has developed a vaccine for the terrible disease of overgrowth. Now one of the challenges of this is that with every vaccine you need a little bit of the disease. So limitations and exceptions have been often framed as the answer to copyright laws excesses. So if we have overdone it with rights, if we have overemphasized uh, uh, incentives, well, let's just whip out another limitation and exception. This will fix the problem. And the challenge, of course, that this vaccine of limitations and exceptions that is responding to every new square inch of territory the copyright wants to grab um, is producing its own kind of dislocation. Because as we all know, the problem with vaccines in the medical sciences is that they trigger problems of, a, of their own. Importantly, they become dependent on the production of the virus or the bacteria that we are trying to eradicate. And so we see today um, limitations and exceptions framed as some sort of immunity to copyrights largesses. Um, and in fact, I want to argue, and I am arguing, that the excesses of the copyright system cannot be redressed only by limitations and exceptions as we construe them today, that in fact, we are grappling with an underdeveloped theory of copyright that has weakened the efficacy of limitations and exceptions. Every limitation and exception responds to a copyright right. It doesn't exist independently, it's not mandatory, and in fact it's unclear who knows whether and to what extent they are useful to protect against the activities that most users are interested in. And this is a challenge, and it's a challenge for a number of reasons. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Most recently, we are all familiar with the EU uh, a directive that has now reconstructed the way in which information is shared and protected online, um, and to the very detriment of the tenets that we believe in a utilitarian view of copyright law is the very reason copyright exists. So from Article 11's requirements about the amount of words and the snippets of information to Article 13's requirements for content providers to filter and screen uploads, all of these extend copyright essentially into the reach of digital spaces, causing much more disruption when it comes to thinking about, well, what kind of limitations and exceptions are we going to adopt to deal with this? If limitations or exceptions are the only instruments that we have to use to counteract developments in copyright law that we think push us further away from the possibility of copyright justice, then we are going to be hard pressed to find enough limitations and exceptions without ceding inherently the copyright law is going to continue to expand. Today, we have abandoned constitutional questions when it comes to copyright scope. We have abandoned the possibility that contracts might uh, 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 facilitate ordinary citizens opting out of fair use rights. We have largely abandoned the possibility that we might be able to use consumer technologies to facilitate access without the buy-in of, of content providers. And so we see that the space in which limitations and exceptions operate is directly correlated to the space in which rights operate. No more, no less. Even fair use, 
even fair use. So, for example, secondly, libraries. We think of Section 108 and certainly libraries in general as an exception to copyright. And so we think of this as copyright limitations and exceptions. So let me just say a couple of things. Copyright law has been unable to address, as some scholars have said, multicultural notions of authorship and authenticity. Uh, the protection of traditional knowledge and an ongoing battle in um, WIPO and around the world is an example of this. Now, you may fall on one side or the other and believe that copyright should not extend to traditional knowledge, or it should, but that's not the point. My point is that embedded in this incentive story and equally embedded in limitations and exceptions is the perfect and ideal author and the perfect and ideal user. Neither the ideal user or the ideal author look like all Americans or all citizens of the global community today. And so the idea that certain works don't count for cultural production is an idea that is not about copyright per se, but it is about the way we've construed the rights and limitations to copyright. And so when you think about our exceptions, um, like fair use, it's always the case that the market factor, that fourth <clears throat> factor, tells us something about what our priorities are in the copyright side of the bargain. Despite many battles over the humanitarian and the importance of access and the importance of the First Amendment, ultimately, copyright law flourishes in response to markets not in response to public use. And that means that our design of limitations and exceptions needs to consider what happens in a world where markets don't exist as the primary reason or the primary validation for the incentive rationale. Because incentives at their heart, what the statute of Anne did by granting authors, not publishers, copyright, was to simply say, we want to create a competitive marketplace. And so the problem, of course, is that ultimately, when you are not dealing with a community or with a society or with the production of goods that respond to popular market hierarchies, we don't have a copyright story to tell. And so there's actually a good reason why there's arguments around or against protecting traditional knowledge. In the same way that these diverse modes of creation and creativity present these issues for copyright, these monolithic um, views of users also create problems for limitations and exceptions. Libraries, as I alluded to earlier, have been pitted as an example of an important limitation and exception. I beg to differ. I would like to suggest to you this evening that libraries are not in the ecosystem of copyright in order to balance the incentives that authors and content creators have. The idea that libraries need an, an exception tells you or suggests to you how entrenched incentives and in market thinking is in our copyright sphere. Because of course, the exception and limitations for libraries presumes that libraries and producers are in competition. That libraries who facilitate access to works are somehow a threat to cultural production. And once we begin to conceive of libraries in that way, we begin to divide and to and, and to create limitations and exceptions for libraries that make it easier for copyright to stay strong, even if libraries have to navigate around their primary role of facilitating access. Libraries, as I have said, are not just intermediaries in the copyright sphere. They are gatekeepers about the ways in which our policy for cultural production unfold and who gets to participate. And this is one of the reasons I love public libraries. Anyone can walk in, anyone can borrow a book or rent a video. It, it, it is the place where our fundamental rights get air 
through the copyright space. That is a very different world from a world that views libraries as competitors to content creators. This fundamental reshaping of limitations and exceptions requires us to insist that we must have a different paradigm for libraries, for museums, for archives, whose role is not in the market, but whose role is to ensure that voices of creativity that lie outside of whatever the cultural dominant framework is have the opportunity not only to read, but also to write. This is why libraries have a diversity of books. This is why we do not have a Hollywood of libraries where only blockbusters can be found on the shelves. This is where unknown, unsung writers, creators, songwriters, etc., exist. And the record of their creativity is there for one generation to another to find. And the idea that when you're doing an analysis of fair use or when you're thinking about an exception and limitation that the primary concern is how do we protect the incentive of those who have managed to accumulate enough capital societally and culturally to make their works available to us as a price is truly blasphemous in my view. This genetic defect in the authorship story has become a genetic defect in the limitations and exceptions story. Let me give you a final example as I begin to wrap up. My key argument, of course, is that limitations and exceptions perform a very different role. They're not part, in my view, of the copyright bargain. They stand apart from it. And that means that they cannot be monolithic, and it means that the actors within the limitations and ex ex exceptions sphere, I was about to say expectations, but there's that, there's that too, um, have to be individuals. They have to be communities. And that our institutions that are meant to encourage those individuals and communities to have access to the popular culture and whatever is in the dominant frame have to be sufficiently enabled to facilitate those communities and their empowerment to access, to read, and to write. Limitations and exceptions today are a mixed bag of coalitions and interest groups, um, book publishers, coin-operated uh, music machine owners, broadcast operators, educators, um, and then this weird notion of the public. And so while I agree with Professor Pam Samuelson, who has recognized that justifications for copyright limitations and exceptions differ ac across countries and include a variety of concerns, where I do disagree is that this is not necessarily a balance. I don't think that the role of libraries or museums or archives, I don't think that the First Amendment, I don't think that the role of indigenous creators, wherever they may be, or the oral reservoir of knowledge that we have accumulated in Native American communities ought to be on the same side of the ledger as the idea that incentives is what's promoting and creating um, ensuring sustainable creativity. I believe that instead, educational institutions, libraries, vulnerable communities, marginalized communities have to be able to use limits and exceptions that are accessible to them. It's not whether limitations and exceptions make works accessible to the public. It's whether members of the public can access those works using limitations and exceptions. The experience in the African American community in this regard is actually quite eye-opening. Many of the aspects of our modern copyright system that I, I value and I tr cherish so much our registration system, the fact that we have a Library of Congress, public libraries, our um, insistence on now following the Marrakesh Treaty, making sure that there is um, uh, accessible uh, format copies for the blind. These are all elements of a copyright system that ultimately always has to have a reason before it makes works available to the public. And the challenge, of course, is that when you think about registration in regard to African Americans, um, till today, the data that I have been assembling suggests that most African American creators, in fact, don't register their works. 
There remains significant levels of illiteracy, a lack of knowledge. In fact, the last couple of community events that I have done has been educating uh, poor uh, communities of color about the importance of safeguarding their cultural works. But I'll never forget the feeling that I had as a scholar, as a teacher, saying to someone, well, you really have this cachet of music and art. You need to register it so that if someone infringes on it, you have a means to protect it. And he looked at me and said, where's the registry? And I said, well, it's online. He said, but ma'am, I don't, I don't have a computer. And I said, um, I think there's still paper versions. Can someone download for you and, and fill it out? He said, ma'am, no one in my family reads. And I thought, wow, I was here bringing an education, so to speak, to a community for whom the accessibility of the limits and exceptions is still the primary concern. And so when you look at the records in the Library of Congress of who registered works, when were they registered, it's not surprising that you don't find many people of color, despite the rich reservoir of creativity that we know exists in these communities. So how do we get limitations and exceptions to communities that create notwithstanding an incentive? This to me is the unfinished business of copyright limitations and exceptions. How do we make these exceptions work not only to facilitate access for all and by all, but to also ensure that what is in the accessible pool includes works of communities whose voices otherwise might not be heard. The architecture of copyright <clears throat> is, I suggest, an architecture that we need to rethink. I suggest that copyright, not because incentives are wrong in and of themselves, but that copyright law's highest possibility is to act as a fiduciary of human creativity. And when only certain kinds of people have their works protected or protectable, when only certain patterns of creativity are honored and preserved, when only certain kinds of people have access to the public interest components of our buildings, we need something like an ADA. We need something like an Americans with Disabilities Act, something that's going to force us to rethink this architecture and facilitate not only access to what should be a growing pool of protected works, but also access to the tools by people who can use those tools easily to navigate around the bounty of knowledge that we've created through this system. It is, I think, a travesty that in a, a generation that we refer to as the knowledge economy or the data society, that there are such large and deep pockets of human creativity that are unrecognized, uncapitalized, and in many ways, un dishonored by our copyright system. And so let me conclude with the following suggestions about where we go from here. I want to suggest that <clears throat> our copyright system begin to look like a copyright system that's created not just for markets, but also for a public that is diverse and that is unequally able to access that knowledge. That means perhaps that our one-size-fits-all system, at least on paper, needs to be rethought. That perhaps the accessibility of music and the accessibility of literary works needs to be reconsidered in terms of how cultural goods and how creators of cultural goods are able to deposit into this zone of creativity. That means, I would argue, that while we give every kind of copyrightable 
subject matter the same rights, then perhaps we ought not to do that. That might also suggest that while we give every kind of copyright right a fair use doctrine or some kind of limitation and exception, we may want to rethink how those limitations and exceptions are affecting particular cadres of society or particular uh, um, areas of society. Larry Lessig has once argued that fair use, as much as we love it, actually doesn't strike enough of a balance in copyright law because not only is it open-ended and vague to assert it effectively, it also actually means that societies that historically have not had the capacity to protect their works, those works become much more easily part of what we might call the fair use bargain. I think that ultimately, certainly for African Americans, for Native Americans, for, for non-dominant cultures, the creativity that we see within their communities is very ripe for limitations and exceptions. And yet, I dare say that when we think of limitations and exceptions, we're not really thinking about accessing works of those communities. We're not thinking about galvanizing, incentivizing, producing a sustainable stream of works from those communities. Limitations and exceptions, if care is not taken, will work to undermine creativity in those communities while at the same time precluding those communities from becoming, from becoming part of a larger conversation. And so I conclude with some of what I think is notable about our system today. The exceptions that we see are exceptions that should contribute to the building, not of a chapel, but of a cathedral. What we need is a copyright edifice that makes registration, that makes copying, that makes accessibility a reality, not only for those who have the wherewithal, but also for the rabble that does not read. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to come and ask questions. I don't know, Sean, do we have a microphone or? They can speak right from their seats. The, the you can speak from your seats. Yep. Um, so, and uh, would you like to have the prerogative of the first question? Well, I'll start just because as you were Yeah. 
So that's sort of one thought that, that as, we, as we think about these sort of, these sort of made to order limitations and questions we've been talking about, or about the virtues and the merits of general flexible shared design. It also Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the latter. Oh, yes, yeah, so people can hear. Uh, so, so Peter thought um, his comments were probably the most important um, limitation and exception to keep our eye on is exhaustion. Because exhaustion is what made possible the, the free circulation of books and, in fact, turned the rabble in 18th century England to readers and then ultimately writers. And so exhaustion with its uh, many faceted uh, pressures, uh, pressure points, particularly globally, um, he thinks is a really important thing to keep our eye on um, because that is, um, as I say in the paper, I, I view that actually as a guardrail. So I actually divided limitations and exceptions into sort of guardrails, right, versus appendages, which is, you know, we are in the appendage mode, but what we need are these guardrails that, that can help us um, think through the purpose of limitations and exceptions. And then, of course, contractual overrides, which libraries are also subject to. Um, and um, so he asked the question, um, you know, how do we really think about contractual overrides? Um, the South African copyright bill has a flat prohibition on contractual overrides, and, um, um, and he was mentioning that this is one of the things that's quite appealing about that. Uh, let me just make a broad um, statement. Uh, two things. One, my view is that if we are going to think of copyright only as a feature of markets, in other words, the only uh, real merit of our copyright system is that it creates these markets and is an instrument for capital accumulation so that we can get big blockbuster films and support these business models. I don't think that that's inherently a bad thing, but I do think we have to be clear that that's what we're doing because that clarity will give us a sense of how we draw boundaries between the kinds of limitations and exceptions that make it possible for the public to access cultural goods and the kinds of limitations and exceptions that make it possible for corporate authors to essentially raid poor or marginalized communities. Those are two very different things. Um, so that clarity to me is, is crucial because right now, every time we say author, I'm thinking, oh, Christine Farley is in her office typing away producing another brilliant trademark article, you know, um, and sweating over it and worrying about footnotes. And, and this is the enterprise in which she is engaged to, to, to advance knowledge. I'm not certainly, and most people are not thinking about the corporate form. But when we say authorship, the gloss and the image, the cognitive dissonance that occurs when that happens means that we are legislating behind the veil. We are creating a copyright law 
for authors that we're not really interested in, in order to facilitate markets that we are interested in. If that's what we want to do, let's do that. But let's do it with authenticity and accountability so that the supplementary regimes that are needed to address the public interest can then emerge. Um, so these contractual overrides, I'm deeply disturbed that we are, and this is probably the, what facilitated this keynote, because you know, Peter can be a contrarian, and, and I thought I should give a paper that reflected you know, his mentorship, so <laughs> I was contrarian. Um, I'm concerned that we are coddling a vision of copyright that remains intact even as the legal regimes that made it more publicly oriented are weakening. Whether it's exhaustion or it's antitrust, it's stronger copyright misuse kind of doctrine, whether it's for sale in the digital environment, whether it's what libraries can do and whether they can own or lease books, all of the underlying assumptions that in its most conservative form, we could live with 40 years ago because we had supplementary regimes to which we could lean and borrow from to offset those consequences um, are much weaker today and copyright law remains unchanged. That's a boat that is going to leave lots of people behind. If we really believe that the role of copyright in its most liberal vision is to facilitate the dissemination of knowledge and, as I've argued tonight, facilitate the participation of citizens in cultural production. We cannot allow these institutions to weaken and yet leave copyright the same. The capacity to use contracts to do anything, to do end runs against a purportedly constitutional end suggests to me that we need to go back to our constitutional arguments of 20 years ago and begin to say, how do we re-envision Congress's obligation and the limits that that public policy might suggest we impose on copyright law? How will that influence our redesign of the law? I, I am unwilling to shy away from the possibility that we need to do something radical if we're going to see a more equal and a more accessible cultural domain. Boss's question. Yes. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Ruth. And thank you, Professor Jassy, also. Um, my name is Andres. I work with PGIP. Um, I have the following, the following question. If copyright is a disease spreading everywhere and exceptions and limitations uh, or fair use are not the cure, as we work every day on exceptions and limitations, and we are like following something that we can never catch, right? Um, but they're just like a vaccine just to cure every symptom, right, that is popping up. My question is, would the cure for the spread of copyright could be found outside of the system? As for example, antitrust law can create a counterweight for corporate law. Should the solution for copyright be found in constitutional law as some European courts have been doing over the last years um, with the European constitutional laws? Shall we create a new field of law independent from copyright law to counterweight and fight in a more equal condition, right? Like antitrust to limit monopolies, copyright monopolies, if you would say so. Um, so again, the words of the beginning, so we can create our own battle horse instead of fighting with little stones, right? Because that's what we're doing. <laughs> Shall be that the solution? Um, so I would say- Would you repeat the question, please? Yes. The question is, do we need to cultivate um, more substantive legal um, solutions and tools if limitations and exceptions are not going to be effective, essentially, in providing the kind of accessibility um, by all, um, is essentially the question. 
And um, I think the answer is there. To be clear, I'm not saying that limitations and exceptions are not useful. I am saying that our dependence on them exacerbates the problem because the current design is that limitations and exceptions come up only when there is a right that has been asserted. And if that's the case, we're already late. Our, con our conception of limitations and exceptions as only or solely a response to a right means that we're not actually advancing the possibility of how folks can access and become a part of the cultural commons. And so my view is, yes, we do need effective um, you know, antitrust uh, regimes. But again, antitrust regimes come um, to the rescue of a stronghold in the marketplace. What I would say is, if we did not have abuse of copyright, if no one ever overreached, if no one ever uh, tried to prevent speech, what kind of limitations and exceptions would we want? I start with libraries because I think they're fundamental for the equality component of the copyright system. That we need an institution or a set of institutions that make sure that there's an accessibility portal for every citizen. We need to think about when we insist on registration before people can bring lawsuits, who's excluded, who's included. We need to think about the fact that many libraries in the South in the United States don't have the budget to make sure that the widest availability of, of resources are available. So what does that mean if they can't get it online without lessons? Now, I, I, I say this because I was a child um, that was rescued by books. I went to sleep with my books. I walked across the street with my books. I read them day and night. They gave me a pathway out of both the poverty and the uh, challenges um, of my growing up years. But every time I am facing uh, an, a community of color in the South, and I'm seeing stories that are being written or histories that are being told, things that will not see the light of day because they're unable to access the marketplace where dissemination occurs, this is a problem. And so in my view, I want us to start not as a reaction to the abuse of copyright, that we need limitations and exceptions for that, but I am equally and perhaps more concerned that our vision of limitations and exceptions is only that. It's only in reaction to abuse rather than creating a set of tools that actually make dissemination independent of abuse possible and that makes, importantly, the participation of a sustainable body of work from a variety of sources and communities part of our cultural discourse. Hey, Ruth. Hey. Josh, can you speak up really loudly? Yeah, so I'm glad you started at that point um, because it seems to me that the overextension of rights itself in the first instance is the problem. But how do we actually capture the hearts and minds of legislators and particularly judiciary who don't do purpose of interpretation, don't recognize expressio unius, and don't apply purpose and objectives conflicts, which they could have done all this time. How do we capture the public's interest in a way that's going to change the hearts and minds of the decision makers that then make resort to the limitations and exceptions unnecessary? Yeah, that's great. Um, so Josh's uh, question is, well, how do we do this? Um, how do we change the law um, so that we actually don't even need uh, to worry about the kind of limitations and exceptions that are available um, and whether they are accessible or not? Um, it's the intractable problem, as you already said, of the political economy of copyright. You know, trademark law has done something that um, uh, 
we may want to think about in copyright law. You know, rather than having this one size fits all, um, there are only so many huge content producers, um, even in the digital environment today. So Netflix is, is huge, but you know, even when we had blockbuster movies, there are only so many movie houses. And it seems to me that we could have categories of copyright so that not everything we do for the capital accumulating kind of business production end of copyright has to infect the entire stratosphere of copyrightable works. I mean, the reality that um, we have so many more authors than we have screenwriters, right? Everyone, I mean, even, if, even in, in the pre-digital age, when you thought about authorship, individual sole authorship, um, that community is a very different kind of community with very different kinds of needs than, say, Hollywood or, or the platforms that are producing content en masse. And it seems to me that we need to, at the very least, begin to ask our legislators, is it possible to think about what our cultural production, market-driven uh, producers need that is different from this vision of copyright as a fiduciary of the information society, copyright law as the fiduciary of um, the public's access and use of knowledge, copyright um, as a framework that is elemental to education, to equality, and to the exercise of civil liberties. This, it strikes me, is a really important space, and we may be able to get some small wins by delineating the rights and the interests of those whose voices and whose capital buys more purchase with the legislatures than anything else. I was reading the history of the Patent Office uh, recently, and it made me also think of something that we might push, and that is um, support for the Copyright Office's ability to um, present itself in communities far from DC. Um, when you look at the lack of use of the Copyright Office by communities of color, including that have produced blockbusting literary and artistic works, this should tell us something right, about the system that we've created um, and who's benefiting from it and who is by design excluded from it. I think this is a critical thing and, and, and it's a tragedy to me that if looking at the records of the Copyright Office, there is an entire history of creativity in the Native American communities, in African American communities, in Hispanic communities, um, that we that we may have lost simply because these were communities that could not get uh, to the office. So that's another thing that I've been thinking about. Are there the Patent Office did this actually? Um, you know, it, it it would go on road shows um, to encourage inventors to 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 come to it. Um, and I think, for me, limitations and exceptions is not just about getting access, it's enabling production by a greater number of people and making it accessible to a greater number of people. I think we have time for one more question. Josh? Uh, I'm going to take the contrary point of view here. Uh, what about the, the creators? You know, there are millions of write, writers, filmmakers, musicians, and such in their 20s. Very few in their 40s. Why? Because they can't make a mon they're on any money. They can't make a living. It's not a lack of talent. I get calls all the time from emails from filmmakers in Nigeria who, before their film even comes out, the first run in Nigeria, people have copied it, redubbed it with different dialogue, which is really an interesting thing to watch, taken cuts. They want to register here so that at least they can go after the people in the Nigerian community who are buying it. The authors in the Middle East who can't get any protection, their books, their poems, I think, from Cabal to Riyadh, there's no protection for them. They can't make a living. The young man you were describing, if he could get to the Copyright Office, which by the way, the electronic divide, I don't care if you're of color, you're white, you're old, you don't have access. You can't even buy a bus ticket, let alone go to the Copyright Office today if you don't have that. So that's, that's a separate issue. The Copyright Office, 
I got lots of issues with, you know, on their lack of access and how they're making it harder for people to register. And that's, but that young man you were talking about, if he can't protect his right, if libraries have carte blanche and they can then make thousands of copies available to the public, they're not buying them. I mean, today they have to buy them and there's limitations. But if, if I understand you and you're saying the library should be this open forum, and I think it's a wonderful idea, but what happens to the writers whose books now they're getting for free and they're not paying for, or the videos, or the music that they're now disseminating magnificently to the public? But those creators are not getting paid. Those creators will not be creators for very long under that scenario. And with the expansion of the fair use and the whole attitude, if it's on the internet, I can use it you're destroying the creators. And without the creators, we have nothing. Distinguished lecture. But I actually think I've we're given not it a few times. I, I, think we're, I think we're not as far apart as you think. So let me just piece apart what I think are three different threads um, in your comments. Um, I think that creators are not created equal, and I think we can all agree with that. Um, you know, I, I'm a law professor because I couldn't be a novelist, to be quite frank. And I, I exercise my creativity when I'm drafting my exams for my students. They get pages of a story. Um, but I wanted to be a novelist, right? So I, I think that it's fair to say that we are not in this. The copyright is not designed only for the commercially um, successful creators. That's my point. So the very people you are talking about are the very people that concern me. Not because of limitations and exceptions, but because the structure of copyright itself makes it difficult for them to access the knowledge that already exists. And every creator needs a limitation and exception to create all of us. We are, we, no one is creating out of whole cloth. The second piece of that, um, I think you, I, I beg to differ that if you can't access the internet and therefore can't buy a bus ticket, you've got bigger problems. Actually, it's a vicious circle. I mean, that's my point. Um, it is a vicious circle. I was stunned, for those of you who saw the, I think it's, um, I don't want to uh, take anyone's name in vain, the, the, whatever the pizza company was that just lost the, the lawsuit. Oh, Domino's. They just lost the lawsuit about making its online app um, accessibly, accessible for blind people. And I thought, and you are arguing about this? And the argument was the ADA does not extend to online services. It only ex applies to, to blind people when they come into my store. I don't have to do anything different to make it possible for blind people to order pizza online. So my point is this, copyright we have treated as this easily neat delineation of law that provides incentives that everyone responds to, and we have limitations and exceptions that counteract its excesses and that make the whole system work over and over again in, you know, in, in this sort of perpetually edifying way. And what I wanted to do tonight was to say, not so fast. Not all limitations and exceptions are equal. Not all of them work well for every community. And in fact, some of them undermine creativity in some communities, including oral-based traditions, right? So there's no question, and I think that just as we can see the abuses of, of, of copyright um, in, in terms of what kind of creativity it, it fosters, we can similarly see the possibility for limitations and exceptions to disempower rather than empower individuals. But I, I, I think the fundamental question is this. If we conceive of copyright as a regime that is necessary for people to receive remuneration for writing and reading and any other creative activity, then the laws that we have in place are not the laws that we need. And I think that's true whether you're making a million dollars or whether you're making zero dollars. If copyright law is a tool primarily for remuneration, there are lots of better regimes that we can use. 
It's a waste of copyright law to think of it that way. That's my view. Instead, what I would advocate, the, the folks in Nigeria, I, I sort of chuckle. I, I, put, I put them with Hollywood. I'm, I'm okay with a separated kind of regime that attends to the realities and the challenges of the marketplace. But if we think of limitations and exceptions writ large as a way for strengthening the public's interest and as a way of keeping the circulation of knowledge at its most optimal and as a way of empowering future creators and users, we have to do something different. And that's my point. And so to me, the community that has no internet, has no local library, is a community that is being failed by the copyright system because there is no other system that we have put in place to facilitate access to knowledge. We don't have another system. And if copyright is going to be the primary policy framework for that, I think we need to reimagine it. To invite you to join us at another reception downstairs. Um, I know we now have a lot of things to talk about so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope that you will stay. Writing songs and performing songs at 40, they're doing construction. They are not. That is ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. I guess, okay, I guess, yeah, I guess Kumbro is heavy. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. See the enormous variety of music that you see the enormous variety of music that is being produced, not for your people who make a lot of money, because they love it. Oh, who's my people? I don't know. Okay, awesome. This notion that there's a birth of the age of the loss. I have so to this day, I haven't given me any rationale that was acceptable as to why I feel so I want to declare you I Where's the data? Except they're coming at it. Sorry. And I saw the contest that they signed with the publishers. Oh, the two of them. They're horrible. Absolutely. It's a contract. I don't know why. That's the one good thing about George. Oh, but they're forever. Oh, I know. Well, yeah, but the termination rights in the United States after 35 years, you can terminate those no matter what. But 35 years, music stays. Most of your art stays. Most stuff is invalid. But also, oh, no, the contract is terrible. My point is in justifying the publisher contract or the art publisher contract or the deals or those kind of things. Not at all. My point is, though, that if you want to give it away, like he wants to give it away, creative commons. Oh, yes, for No, no, I don't know. I'm just saying, you can always do a creative commons kind of thing. If you want to give it away, give it away. Like Radiohead say, let's put the, the bid on this uh, song somewhere. Well, no, creative commons means the, the copyright owner says, anybody can use it. Just give me attribution or don't give me that's fine. So if people want to give it away, let them give it away. And if they want to sell it, let them sell it. Let them, let them, let them make the living. I want to go see a friend who might have seen in a while. Okay, take care. Thank you for doing that. I have my hand on it. It's pretty much the same. The nation of the world that has the greatest use of libraries is Finland. And if Finland's a big chunk. Exactly. That was the one that I was going If you want to. So it's really a matter of devoting the cultural dollars to get Getting the books in in the first yeah. place and making yeah. sure that there are uh, libraries accessible to people, uh -huh. which is social. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily uh -huh. the library. Uh -huh.
I Josh, do you understand that from what she was saying? I have to admit, I frankly didn't fully understand what she was saying. I suggest that I have been retired for too long. <laughs>